Hey, 3D MJers, this is Andrea Valdez, and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. Today, you're going to hear Alberto Nunez, Brad Loomis, and Brian Miner tell you how to run an intentional and successful caloric surplus phase as a bodybuilder. Essentially, they're going to discuss how to most effectively use your food for maximum gains. Most people are afraid of this phase for fear of putting on fat, so they'll try to use training as the main or only vehicle for adding muscle mass between cutting seasons. But as you'll hear in this show, using your lifts and your caloric intake intelligently can usually reap more rewards. So that's why you'll want to hear this pod and stick around for the whole thing. As always, if you have any feedback or comments on this particular episode, head on over to 3dmusclejourney.com or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash team 3dmj and leave it under podcast number 222. Let's get into it. Here is how to run a surplus with Brad Loomis, Brian Miner, and Alberto Nunez. I have a question for both of you, gents, but uh, Brian, let's let's hear from you first on this. When it comes to um, you know our 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 typical athlete here at 3D Muscle Journey, somebody that's kind of intermediate ish, maybe very late novice. Um, what do you think is more important? Do you think it's more important for hypertrophy if you're, you're eating in a surplus or do you think it's more important that we focus on progressive overload? What do you think is the most important uh, aspect there? I mean, I think, you know, the nutrition aspect, you can't really capitalize on that unless you're, you see progressive overload. So I think in, I mean, maybe like in a novice athlete or an untrained individual, if you put them in a surplus, they may gain some lean body mass, you know, whereas if you take intermediate to advanced individual, you know, that's, that's trained and you put them in a surplus in the absence of effective training, that's, that's not really going to do much for them. So, except put on body fat. So I think in that case, it's to me, like it's very hypothetical scenario. It's like, cause usually we're aiming to do them in conjunction, but I think caloric intake and just nutrition in general is kind of secondary to the training stimulus. Berto, how about you? You're putting on uh, pounds right now. What's your input on that? Yeah, I guess the the newer you are to training, the you know you you just kind of recomp like a rank beginner. Like you know, I think most of us when we first started training, just kind of trained. There probably wasn't a whole lot of changes when it comes to the diet, and you see some really good progress. But you know, a few months in, like you really can't count on that. And you know, at the very least, like you want to be eating enough, and would probably expedite that. I think, <laughs> I think that's why a lot of people become perma bulkers because you experience the benefits of overeating, and you're like, wow, this is this is great. And you know, the way it usually goes is. People tend to <laughs> overuse like anything that uh, brought them some some positive feedback. So, um, so yeah, it kind of depends on on training age. But it just kind of goes to show you that like training is is like Brian said is like it's it's that important because without the training, like nothing like really really happens. I'm reminded of this like every time I go to Whole Foods. It's like man, these folks are like extra particular about what it is that they're eating like it's it's that demographic but it's like like weight train like yeah. a lot of the things that you want like because yeah. if you actually want it's like you'd get from weight training um so so yeah it kind of depends on your training status your training age and uh the longer you've been training you probably want a little bit less of that like wishy-washy sort of ambiguous uh caloric can take you you wanted to head in this direction or 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 that direction yeah because i know that i've kind of come a little bit 180 you know when it comes to um the things i'm looking at 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 folks you know when they're when they're presented with us uh to you know coach and and make things a little bit more optimal right um used to be i would just focus on training 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 let's make sure that we got all of our variables checked off, you know, make sure first of all, that we've got something that you could adhere to, you know, let's make sure that our sets are where we want them. Let's make sure that, you know, if, if progression is possible, we're setting up, up in, um, you know, a, a good fashion or at least something that's achievable and get all those, as many of those, those check boxes marked off. Right. 
And then I would just kind of like, especially because so many of our folks are so focused on their aesthetics, right? I would just kind of say, okay, let's just make sure we're not losing weight. You know, we can, we can just kind of ride here, make sure we're getting the most out of our training. Don't worry too much about, about gaining weight. You know, let's just kind of just not lose weight, you know? And I don't know, I think it was just probably two years ago, you know, it was just kind of like the, I don't know, every, the writing on the wall with all the evidence was kind of like, you've got to eat in a surplus, you know, in order to really get the most out of your training, you know what I mean? Especially in those, those more advanced athletes. And so then that was kind of like, okay, once I had as many of my training boxes checked off, then I started really digging into, into nutrition and what body weight was doing too. Sometimes when people come to us and they're like, yeah, I haven't really, you know, made many gains here over the last year, 18 months, two years. Um, you know, what's, what's going on? I almost kind of like start asking them questions about what's their body weight been? What's it been doing? Has it been going up? Has it been staying the same? Have you cut too much, you know, et cetera. So, um, yeah, with all that being said, how much has that affected you guys, you know, over the last couple of years? Like, did you have an epiphany like I did? It's just like, okay, wow. When all the, all the boxes are checked off or as many of them are as we can, you know, when, when did, did you guys kind of have, or did you even have that epiphany that we better start looking at nutrition and protein and is body weight going up? I think for me personally, it's kind of arrived at the same place, but I think the, it was sort of the other way around. I think early on in, in my bodybuilding career and coaching career, it was like this emphasis on nutrition, like almost not overemphasis, but an overemphasis on a caloric surplus. I'll say that mm. like the big guy in the gym was, you know, you got to eat to grow and, you know, red meat, you know, and just like <laughs> hammering calories. And, and so I think now there's, there's more information out there and, you know, beginners are less, you know, prone to that occurring. But I think for me, it was actually sort of a, a gradual realization that, Hey, the surplus doesn't, it, it, it needs to be there in order to optimize muscle growth, but it, it doesn't need to be to the degree that maybe I thought early on. Um, and, and so that, that's how it's been for me. I think all else equal, you know, uh, there's eating at maintenance versus being in a slight surplus. You're most people are going to gain more muscle in, in the surplus. And I think there's also, I mean, that's an area of conversation we can maybe dive into in a bit. I think like just levels of body fat on the individual kind of influence the amount of, you know, benefit of a given surplus. So in the experience level as well. So, um, but yeah, I think, uh, I, I sort of brought my surpluses down as time went on with myself and my athletes, um, rather than like committing to a larger one. But I, I, I think we're both in agreement that it's a surplus is better than no surplus. If the goal is muscle growth. Bruno, how about you? Yeah. So I guess when I inherit an a athlete situation, usually what I pick apart is like, what's the thing you're neglecting the most, you know, cause everyone has this one thing. Um, it can be a lot of things, right? It can be like, you don't lift very hard. <laughs> there we go. You've been on these sound complicated programs, but you don't lift hard. Um, or it's like, oh, you, you, you don't sleep enough or, or you don't eat enough. Like, <laughs> so, and, and, the um, they're not eating enough. It, it does happen. I, th I think it's probably the one that happens most frequently. And, that is because most people, when they start looking at going through the whole body recomp, through the whole bodybuilding ordeal, you always sold on the fact that, like, you know what, what's going to impact the way you look more than anything is fat loss. So <laughs> with gaining, you know, unless, like, you, you start really lean or, like, really underweight, which is less and less of a common thing these days, like, you, you, you don't see the benefits right away. It's like... Legit, you're, 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 this person's going to have to invest. Um, so th the issue with um, th that I do run into quite frequently is that no one's really given gaining a fair try because it's it's always like been kind of 
they just they, they don't get as precise as like maybe they do with their fat loss phases. And I think your first few gaining phases, look, eventually they're going to be pretty relaxed and you're going to like the fact that there's a little bit bigger of a margin, like a margin of error there. But like to start, it's like, OK, you're going to have to treat this like a fat loss phase because otherwise you're going to be two, three months into this thing and be like, man, th these gaining phases, they, they just don't work. Like I, I just end up getting fat. Like a lot of people's gaining phases are just that like they there was no structure. There was just a certain period in their life where they didn't have all the controls over their situation, their environment. They kind of turned into like weight trending upwards and three months later they're like yeah this gaining stuff doesn't work i need another fat loss phase and it's going to be like their fourth or fifth one in like the last two years and because they've been yo-yoing the damn thing um you know they they just don't make any significant progress um and and gaining muscle like it is man it is it is body fat makeup like you will look so much better at any body fat like i i will um often use the example of it's kind of an extreme example but like for example like russ or right like that dude is obviously he's hyper muscular uh and like very very round bellies but like most of the time like he's rocking like 20 ish percent body fat and and i'm not saying that that's where you will end up if you go through a gaining phase if it were only I guess that fair, but it, but it isn't. Uh, but just it's it's an extreme example of like how that works. It's like that dude's twenty percent body fat. Like if you saw him squatting shirtless at your gym, you'd be like, "Fuck, dude, this dude's twelve. You mm -hmm. know. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of people's answers are on that side, but it's going to take like you're gonna have to be strategic much in the same way as like you are with your fat loss phases, at least the first few goes. And then, then eventually you get to relax a little bit, uh, but but th that's where I see people go wrong with with uh, the the gaining because very often that is the issue is just like that that history that I, I mentioned where it's it's a lot of being all over the place and never do they really one hundred percent commit to to gaining in an orderly fashion. That's the magic of muscle, isn't it? You know, just how good it looks even with a little bit of body fat over the top of it, you know, in this, this day and age of people getting, you know, DEXA scans and in-body tests and things like that, we'll go through a gaining phase where we say, say we gained a, a good 10 solid pounds, you know, using the average. And people are like, wow, I gained 10 pounds and I'm pretty happy with how I look. I can't believe, you know, that I, I look this good. And of course, all the training variables are in place and everything, you know, and then they go get that damn in-body test, you know, <laughs> and it says there that, you know, basically the, 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 the summary of the in-body test compared to their old one was that they gained 70% of their gain of their, of their, their, their weight gain was fat and 30% of it was muscle. And then they're disappointed. They're like, man, that's all I got was 30% of my gain was, was muscle. And I'm like, you know what? Hold on a second. Before you even got that dumb test, you were pretty happy with how you looked, you know, when you gained that, you know, 30% of whatever your gains were, were, were muscle. How come now you're not, you know? And that's, I just want to kind of drive home kind of in a visual aspect that, that magic of uh, what muscle, you know, looks like when you're gaining it. And it's that, that's kind of a good ratio, actually, like what you just described. Like I'm about to gain 20 something pounds for the sake of maybe gaining a pound of muscle. Mm -hmm. That's just the cost of doing business, like eventually. Um, but, but yeah, the, the fact that muscle, the fat, the muscle helps kind of lift up fat and make it look a little better is the reason that we all overshot our like estimated stage weights the first time we decided hey let's let's mm -hmm. do this and we we missed it <laughs> some of us by bigger margins than others by by quite a bit i was up there at 190 i think my first go around because like i'm like i'm 210 and if i <laughs> hold my breath i can see some abs so yeah i find that it's harder for most people to have that structure like I, I feel like off season eating habits tell a lot about kind of the the health of someone's eating behaviors as a whole. Yeah. Um, because I think dieting, like the structure that's required for you know predictable fat loss, like that, a lot of people thrive off that kind of structure. But when the goal is gaining, in from like a performance perspective, you're almost getting rewarded for like 
overshooting in some sense you know it's like if you Mm -hmm. have a thousand calorie surplus on a given day it's like well i just performed a little bit better so and when that's kind of the shift in perspective transitioning into the off season focusing on performance sometimes it's easy i think for people to justify like okay i'm just going to be a little bit looser with this and you know reap the the benefits that it provides and i think that can it can be an issue if there's like a large disparity in eating behaviors, you know, from off season into to prep. But I think for other people, sometimes it's, it's a healthy change in a sense, like it it really depends on the individual. So, um, but yeah, I think for, for most people gaining at a conservative rate is one of the hardest things they they can do in the off season and and so like don't feel bad if you do overshoot it a little bit because like the primary objective still being met like you might have created a little bit you know additional work to to take the fat off but like always make it the goal to gain at a conservative rate but it's most people overshoot it to some extent i think at some point in their training career yeah because like we talked about earlier it's probably better to gain something, whether it's conservative, yeah. like you said, or overshoot, than it is to just kind of stay nothing and maybe even lose a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. over the the course of however long. And that was that's sometimes, especially the folks, because I'm I'm opposite from you, Brian. I got into this wanting to get the abs, you know, lose weight because I was kind of a chunky kid, you know what I mean, and I'd never been a very athletic looking. Uh, person. So I was the exact opposite of you. It was just always fat loss, fat loss, fat loss. And I mean, especially when you're, you know, a, an early, early uh, novice, I was getting great results, not gaining, you know, great results. And then all of a sudden, when one day it just smacked me upside the side of the, the head that was like, you, you, you can't, you're mad at yourself because you think you're doing something wrong. You're not doing anything wrong. It's just, this is the natural evolution of, of the lifter, you know? Um, but that's a nice little, almost a, 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 a light bulb moment for, for athletes that are like me when you kind of focus on aesthetics. When they come to that realization that, you know what, it's okay. How should I, how should I say this? It's, it's, you want to keep training even when you're gaining. Because sometimes mm-hmm. people will get this block. It's like, well, my, my nutrition is not on point. You know what, I'm not tracking things. Uh, I'm gaining weight, you know, I'm kind of sloppy with my, my nutrition. So I'm not going to train because it's not going to be of any, any benefit. You know what I mean? I'm not burning the calories, you know, and it's a really nice little light bulb moment when it's like, you know what, that's almost going to, that needs to be your staple. That needs to be the thing that is always in place, regardless of whether you're sloppy on point Mm -hmm. gaining you know, losing, it doesn't really matter. And then they're like, oh, so I can keep training even though I'm not tracking my macros. I'll still get benefit from that. And I'm like, you're probably going to get better benefit from it than if you were tracking your macros and not training, you know? Um, so with that all being said, you know, what, what are kind of the variables that you guys like to look at? You know, I know that when we're in a fat loss phase, we're looking at calories, right? Make sure that we're in the correct caloric deficit for the rate of loss that we want. But when you're gaining, you know, other than the scale, of course, like you said, Brian, being in a conservative uh, surplus, what are the things that you guys like to look at and be in control of and make sure that are that are on point? I mean, I think the the rate of gain is going to be influenced by like when, when I'm planning a surplus. Initially, a lot of it's influenced by the experience level, like training status of the individual. Um, and the more advanced they become, I think the the it seems evident that the degree of surplus doesn't there's gonna the point of diminishing returns will be sooner than it would be for a novice who could you know i think there's some research that had novices consuming like a 2000 calorie surplus in training and the majority of what they gained was was you know lean body mass and that was an untrained you know previously untrained population but um I think as you get more advanced, the the magnitude of surplus goes down, and so that that's sort of how I plan that aspect. And additionally, if somebody is like a higher level of body fat, or you know above their their set point for body fat, and there's 
probably a greater likelihood that they're going to be able to fuel some of that, you know, energetic cost of building muscle through, you know, the energy from body fat. So the potential for, I think, recomp is, is greater the more above your, your set point that you are. And I think, you know, most people realize that, but, you know, I think outside of that, you know, just not to be honest, not a lot changes. Like I don't, I don't proactively adjust volume based off if somebody's in a surplus or a deficit, at least out of the gate. Like I, I t try to be pretty reactionary with that type of stuff. Um, because you know, the, you know, 200 calorie caloric swing from, you know, maintenance into a surplus, like that's, I think it kind of goes back to the idea, like what you can recover for might, or recover from might be greater, like the degree of volume, but you know, recovery capacity and what's optimal for muscle growth aren't always the same thing. Like your, your MRV is not, you know, to it's, it's not always where you're going to be gaining, you know, oftentimes it's not where you're going to be gaining the most muscle mass. So, um, you know, I, I tend to manage volume, you know, regardless of phase that I'm in or have somebody in based on performance, um, you know, motivation to train, um, you know, exercise selection, you know, if they're enjoying the movements and how much volume each, each of those is, is going to, you know, benefit from and, you know, are they staying healthy? So I, I think a lot of people sometimes get caught up in the idea that when you're in a surplus, you can do more when you're in a deficit, you can do less. So they should, you know, increase volume by a third when they're in a surplus, if they're at maintenance. And it's just, there, there's a lot of unnecessary number crunching, I think, and kind of micromanaging when like, you know, that slight flux in intake is, you know, over time, it may require some adjustments, but out of the gate, I would stay pretty reactionary with it in the past. And primarily just watching what the scale does? Well, watching what the scale does and looking at performance. Um, mm. You know, I think performance is a great proxy for muscle growth over time, you know, across, you know, multiple rep ranges. Like a 1RM going up isn't the best proxy, you know, especially mm -hmm. in the short term. But um, I think it's easy, you know, with this emphasis on performance to to kind of apply that, like in a deficit condition too, where people tie their performance on the way down to their ability to maintain muscle mass. And I think once you enter deficit conditions, because there's changes in, you know, stability within movements, changes in just, you know, circumference of, of specific muscles, you know, the body fat around joints, just tissue leverages to kind of use that term with that changing, like performance can go down independent of muscle loss. And it, it usually does, you know, on mm -hmm. like a back squat. Um, and so, you know, looking at things like isolation movements can actually kind of be a better proxy in performance for those rather than more coordinated movements. Um, whereas like in the off season, I think you can kind of look at both, but I think sometimes I know we're supposed to be talking about a surplus, but in deficit conditions, people tend to, okay, my performance on my squat is going down or my RDL is going down or my bench is going down. Like something needs to change And like, I ne either need to start eating more. Maybe the deficit's too aggressive. Maybe I need to pull back on volume. And in many cases, it's just a outcome of less favorable mechanics, you know, at, at that newer body weight. And so, um, so I think that's, that's important to remember when we kind of discuss performance, you know, in conjunction with energy state. Okay. All right. So yeah, we've got, we're going to watch the scale. We've got to kind of track our training performance in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, Berto, do you have any other variables or is there anything else that you kind of focus on? Um, especially when making sure that you've got your, your, your bases covered when, when gaining? No, I think Brian covered most, most everything there. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, again, it's like when whenever I'm dealing with an athlete, first thing I look for is, it's like, how are you? How are you messing this up? You know, and that's <laughs> legit what we're gonna pick on. You know, and and that's why it's always hard because uh, sometimes you are <laughs> the messenger in, in these situations where the person's doing a lot of things right, and they've been doing a lot of things right for a long period of time, 
And it's like, ah, you're just, like, kind of done with that intermediate phase. Like, that's all that is. And, like, this is just how it's going to be from, from now on. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, same as, same as Brian. It's, it's similar thought process and, and um, yeah, yeah, like, I guess he said it all there. One other thing I was going to mention is I think one thing that personally has been brought more to the forefront of my thought process with this as I've gotten older is like, do I, do I really want to push into a large surplus, you know, from a health perspective? Like, is, is that extra pound worth gaining 20 pounds for, you know, from a blood work perspective for somebody, for example. And I, obviously in Berto's case, it's like he's coming from stage condition and working his way back up. But, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do think there's, there's something to be said for keeping things a little bit tighter in the off season as you get older, um, and not, you know, having these 35, 40 pound swings, you know, from stage weight to off season. Um, so another point I just wanted to mention before I forgot it. And honestly, I think just while we're on that topic, just it, that applies to everything. It's like a lot of these things, you don't start applying to your own situation until you have no no choice, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, it goes each generation gets a little smarter. Like we, we were all kind of wrecked pretty hard from like the first gens of like the DUP, you know. Um, <laughs> right? We're getting our... <laughs> our squat volume for muscle growth primarily via like squats after some you know along with all the other things that they go on in, in, in the week um so so yeah I, I guess for the kids listening out there it's like dude it's like the the more you can pick up on these things earlier not just when it comes to like hey like maybe don't do this up and down with your like your your body uh but like you know taking care of your joints um like just monitoring like, like for me like sleep this last prep was a big one it took a prep for me to figure that out that i'm like oh shoot when i sleep enough my brain's pretty much the same or at least i can't tell the difference so so yeah yeah i think and i think it's hard because we all grew up with those old dudes that were like always trying to you know like hate on our situations it's like you know when you get to be my age you can be able to even like walk into you know to the gym but um but yeah yeah the older i get the more things that like uh Jeff and a few other select individuals that have been telling me for years. I'm like, oh, okay, that that's kind of making sense now. But uh, but yeah, no, I'm with you, Brian. Like with the whole like I guess more holistic approach to this because you know we're trying to get them like you said them cholesterol PRs at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta watch those LDLs, right? <laughs> Hey, 3 DMJers, Andrea again, popping in to tell you about a new free nutrition plan calculator we've just released, a new macro setting course we're dropping soon, and how you should prepare for that by getting your maintenance calories in check. So first off, we have created a companion calculator to go along with our free course all about how to run a recovery diet. The recovery diet is the exact plan we use for our competitive athletes as soon as they get off the bodybuilding stage, and we have a newly updated free course on it that's available to all Vault members. Essentially, anyone who wants to go to 3dmjvault.com and sign up with their email address has access to the recovery diet and four other of our free courses in the Vault, and this new companion calculator that has made it even easier for you to create your plan and get tailored instructions on what to do next. So you'll enter your age, sex, stage weight, height, whether or not your season is over, the time you have between now and your next show, and you'll be able to see which of our recovery diet plans best suits you and your goals. We've added this calculator as the last chapter in the course after all the instructional videos and the PDF printout. So just go to 3dmjvault.com, log in, and it's already there waiting for you. Secondly, we're finally releasing our course on how to calculate your macros for gaining and cutting on January 31st. It'll go over all the protein, fat, and carb calculations that our coaches use as starting points for all of our athletes, and this will be for Vault VIP members only. So if you're a VIP subscriber, we'd like to remind you of a couple things to get yourself ready for that course drop. Number one, we need you to make sure that macro tracking is even a goal you should have or a practice you should start. We recommend taking or retaking the transitioning away from tracking course that you already have access to in your student dashboard. 
In that course, Eric will go over the nutrition tracking research in detail, and Steve will go over the practical uses, benefits, and harms that it can cause depending on your goals and situation. And number two thing that we suggest doing would be taking the calculating your calories course, which is also already included in your VIP membership, because that's the number you'll base your macros off of. So if you've already taken this course or you've been following 3DMJ for any amount of time, you'll know that these calculations are simply an educated starting point. And we always require at least a couple weeks of data collection to see if all those assumptions need tweaking. And we'd like you to take the time to do that before you take the macro course, which is why we're sort of pre-announcing this one for the first time here, because it really does build upon the prerequisite knowledge of whether it's a good idea for you to start this, and if so, where your actual maintenance calories fall as a baseline. For all those courses mentioned, you can learn more about them and sign yourself up at 3dmjvault.com. Again, that's 3dmjvault.com. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. One thing that I, I kind of want to take this uh, in, into this direction, um, like I mentioned, so many of our, our folks that we we, we talk with um, that maybe they're, they're not necessarily competitive at, well, I, I shouldn't even say that, some of them they are. But these these folks that are kind of like they're they're eternally lean, right? You know, they they they're in this this state where okay, I don't want to be this this lean. I want to have some muscle, you know. Or like Berto, he's coming out of competition prep, you know. And sometimes these folks they come to us after their first prep. They've done their first prep on their own, and you know now they kind of want to maximize their off season. And some of these folks, I'm like, you know what? You've never you've never been over 200 pounds, you know. And I think that one of the things that we need to focus on this this off season is get you to kind of a PR body weight, you know, you're five foot 10, five foot, you know, nine, and you've never been much over about 200 pounds. You know, maybe we need to get up there and we need to spend some time training in that environment of being 210, 212 pounds. And sometimes even if we don't get there, just trying to get there and then sustain as high as we can, well, a lot of times yield some, some very productive, you know, training time. But, you know, with that being said, how much is too much? You know, uh, I, I, I have I've seen and heard people say that when body fat levels are pretty darn high, you can actually possibly get a little bit of recomping from pulling into that energy reserve that you have stored all over your body, you know, but what are your guys take on that? What's what's too high? What's too fat? What's gaining too fast? I The number I always just as a rough rule of thumb the number i kind of always go to for a competitor especially if i know their stage weight is like pushing much past 20 percent over stage weight could be starting to kind of spin not spin our wheels but you're just creating more work for yourself like most mm -hmm. people by then are already making you know at a body fat that's allowing them to make really solid progress i mean there's going to be exceptions and um, but I, that's kind of where I tend to manage someone's off season, kind of bouncing, you know, conservative gain up to maybe 20 ish percent above, hold it for a bit if we'd like, um, and then just kind of run a mini cut and kind of rinse and repeat. Um, but I, I think there's also, and, and Berto, I know we've talked about this, some um, like body fat distribution, like some people that may struggle some, you know, like that are very lower body fat dominant, maybe staying a little bit leaner in the off season can, can have its advantages. Um, if you're a competitor, for if sure. you're a competitor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, it's going to be different for, for everybody. And I think where they naturally hang out, but I, I do it just to kind of put numbers to it. I, I think if I were to average everything out, I'd say 20 ish percent over seems to, to be a reasonable starting point to kind of assess from. And Berto, you've been as high as 250 pounds before. Do you feel like that was necessary or did that, was that even productive at all? <laughs> um, it was a fun body, like for sure. And it was, it was cool <laughs> to say it was 250. Uh, you had a Actually, couple four was, pound sandwiches in you at that oh point too. God. And yeah, yeah. It was evening weight with my clothes. I just needed to get to that number for some reason. Um, <laughs> see, it was different. It was just, it was a different environment. Like there was kids around my age cause I was in like my early twenties and, uh, a lot of them were juiced up, 
And I didn't care. It's like, I'm keeping up with you. Like, it was it was the exact opposite. Like, I didn't ask anyone who was on the juice and who wasn't. It was just like, no, if he's doing that, then I, I need to do that too. You know? Like, that that that's how that was. Um, <clears throat> but, no, it was, it was not necessary at, at all, I think. Uh, I realized that very quickly as soon as I came back down. And I was still hitting PRs. Hitting PRs, like, really deep into, like, that diet. I'm like, wow, I just hit an all-time squat PR at 210. So my best squat PR ever, like my best squat performance ever was like a 210. So I'm like, whoa, okay, maybe that was that was dead weight. Um, and I was still putting on muscle, I think, if we're being perfectly honest, because I had so much there in, in the reserves. Um, I think it did more for me when it comes to like a body image sort of deal. Because, um, yeah, I, I think it's important that people develop like like two like different outfits that you really enjoy for for different reasons um you know your first outfit's gonna be like like this is just your summer lean body it's like okay it's like i look forward to wearing that but then you know on the other side <clears throat> the one that to a large extent is the reason that you have that like you know your your summer bathing suit uh is is because of like this other guy over here and, and that one it gets overlooked like too often and and um, I think especially more so for the serious casual bodybuilder. It's like you got to learn to love that because there's a lot of good things that come from that body, but you just, like, you don't give it enough time to, like, settle. Like, when I think of myself in the 180s, it's like, I think of all the wonderful perks that come with that. It's like, man, I can do some, like, pretty fun things in the weight room. Like, I shoot last off season. I think it was, like, in the... Mid 180s, my buddy was uh, deadlifting. I'm like, oh, I'll deadlift with you, whatever. You know, it's like I'm taking a week off and just pulled 525 for like with lo slow eccentrics for a set of eight. Like, just like, oh, that's fun. This body is fun, you know, and, and I like feeling big in my clothes. So you got to give yourself, like, you've got to start building a list of pros when it comes to that. So for the casual bodybuilder, it's like where you go to, it's like going to be kind of a personal preference thing. Just don't let the, that things get usually can be a little bit higher than you like but as you go through more gaining phases you'll see that that other suit you wear like just it, it looks better and better every time so yeah for the contest prepper it, it's one of those where it's like okay we're strictly business here our contest weight like that is our anchor uh but for everyone else it's like just learn to love them just as much and eventually like you can you can i see perks to, to both I, and if i'm being perfectly honest like the physique I hate the most is, from a personal standpoint, it's like, there for business is my contest prep when, like, it's fun, it's different. But, oh, no, it's like, I am, like, I had to plan a photo shoot around that thing because I'm like, I don't want my face looking like that on, on <laughs> these cute pics I was supposed to get with the girlfriend. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, with it, they have a lot more leeway. Uh, and I think what a good coach does is, like, he kind of... Yeah, he facilitates that process. He's the enabler to some extent because that is what some people need, you know, because Instagram and social media is like thinking you. It's like, no, you got to go the other way, like at, at all times. Um, but, um, but yeah, and I guess from there, um, since we talked about how with gaining phases, it's like, okay, I need you to be focused. Like this can't just be like, all right, I guess when I go out with my friends, I'm just going to eat whatever I want and like eat all their fries and you know, go through leftovers in the fridge. No, that's that's, that's not what it is. Um, and much like with gaining phase, with fat loss phases, you know, maybe someone who hasn't had a whole lot of successful successful experiences with previous fat loss phases. It's like, all right, let's let's do an eight to ten weeker. Let's 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 do that, and then we'll put that away for a while. We'll come back, and then next time we can do a twelve. I think the same thing with the gaining phases, and I think in the past, and I think this was more so. I should have made it more clear. This is what I was recommending was probably more so for the skinny males that, you know, like they're they're my height, but they're like 140 pounds. It's like for them, that'd be what I was recommending about like, hey, go one, two years without a deficit. Like, absolutely. Like, just 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 do that. But uh, <laughs> they're becoming more and more rare. Like when I get one on a Skype, I'm like, oh, wow, it's like you are an endangered species. Like they, they just that, that <laughs> does not exist anymore. Um, yeah, it's like with the gaining phase, the same thing. It's like, hey, let's start with like six months of like really focused and, uh, and, and we'll start there. And then eventually we'll get to like eight months, maybe, maybe at some point, even 10 months. Um, but that's usually like 
the length of a gaming phase I like, somewhere between 6 to 10, because people generally like need texture in their life. Like It's kind of hard to just focus on one thing for way too long. And then it also, by, by having these fat loss phases, in between those gaining phases, you get to practice fat loss. Because like I've done it before where it's like, man, I ain't seen a deficit in a year and a half. I start that deficit, I'm like, this is, like I am so rusty here. Like it, it takes me a month to get to the point where I'm like, I'm actually kind of sort of doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so I think it's, it's good to reward yourself with like one of those. So something, you know, after like six months, eight months of gaining, uh, usually when it comes to the gaining, especially with these numbers thrown around, like, okay, you got to gain like half a percent to 1% of your body weight. It's like, I, look, I can't do that. Like, I, I cannot do that. Like, my life would have to be so regimented. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it wouldn't be practical. It's like, my gym's big enough where I'd have to tell my girlfriend, Cynthia, I can't go see you in the leg room because you're going to cut into this experiment, you know? <laughs> so what I like to do with people, and you kind of hinted at this, Brian, is the fact that fat loss is... The reason people like it so much is because it, it works really, really fast. It doesn't have the biggest impacts necessarily, we're speaking like long term, but it, it works fast. So if we overshoot it by a little bit, it's like, who cares? That's two more weeks of dieting. Like, we'll, we'll live. So usually what I'll do is like, okay, you got six months to gain anywhere between, I don't know, six to 11 pounds. And like that automatically, like, okay, it's like, okay, we have a general direction this is enough weight where like the intake wasn't ambiguous and some months are going to be faster. Some months are going to be slower and like, that's okay. And then what ends up happening is usually when people get to wherever they get, say they gain nine pounds and they like math it out, they're like, Oh wow, that was like highly appropriate. Like this 0.75 that I've been trying to like execute like it's i actually did it and it was in a much more relaxed state because in general yeah gaining is going to be a slightly more relaxed state um and they get to see that it's like oh yeah but you know we had some structure there we had something to aim for i think that's super important it's like you kind of have to make your goals explicit in the same way that people do with fat loss basically but um but yeah that's usually the strategy it's like six months for beginners then maybe we can tack another two months because another two months of training in the state like that's going to do you some good especially at that point um and you know for some people when they've been doing this long enough it's like shoot we can get pretty close to a year maybe even a year of doing this and they're able to stay focused on this task for for that long uh but same thing with the gaining it's like i'm gonna give them some ranges some months will be slower some months will be faster but it all starts for like with like just figuring out what that range is going to be and and make it a little bit more detail than just like, okay, I'm going to go on a bulk, bro. Cause that's usually what people do. Yeah. So uh, I just kind of similar, similar things. Like I'll, I'll, a lot of times we'll give, um, depending on the person, I'll give them a range of like, okay, this is the body weight that I want you to be like the 140 pounder bro that you were talking about. Okay. You know what? You're, you're going to go away now for, for four months doing this stuff that I just told you, you know, and when you come back, I want you to be between 155 and 162 make it happen. You know, you've got the, the, the guidelines, you've got the protocols here, make it happen, you know? Um, but my, I guess my, my, my question to you guys now is it's like, okay, you've got these, uh, um, these folks that they're, they're executing their plan, they're getting their body weight up, right? They're, they're doing everything that they're supposed to do. Um, what do you guys see sometimes as red flags? Like, okay, you know what? We've got the body weight going up. You're, you're, you're meeting the things that I wanted you to do, but this is a red flag. That's a red flag. You know, like one of the things that I like to do is I like to kind of get some periodic physique photos, you know, usually when they're kind of coinciding with milestones, you know, okay, we put on five pounds here. Let's get some good physique photos. If it's a competitor, let's get the front symmetry, back double bicep, you know, kind of side chest. Let's see what you think, which, what we're looking like. Then we'll kind of like continue on, you know, uh, or sometimes it's like, they get lost in their bulk and they've put on seven, eight pounds. Well, still, let's get some pictures, you know. And if I don't like what I'm seeing, you know, it's kind of like the body fat is going on really unevenly. You know what I mean? I'm seeing it all on their 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 midsection or, you know, all on their, their uh, right in the love handle there. I'll be like, you know what, let's, let's slow down here a little bit. Maybe let's use a little mini cut bridge, um, you know, to use that term uh, from our podcast, mini cuts, you know, not so fast. Maybe we can get Steve to, to link that in there, you know. Um, 
that's kind of a red flag for me. I don't, I don't like what I'm seeing here. You know, the way this is going, what are red flags that you guys, uh, you guys see Brian, how about you? I think, yeah, what you said, I think is definitely a good point. I mean, if they're, if, especially if their body fats, like if you've run a fat loss phase with them in the past and their body fat distribution is less favorable at a given weight on the way back up, that, that can be a red flag of potentially maybe going a little bit too fast. Um, you know, I, I do lean on performance to a large extent, but I think if, if someone's in a surplus, but they're not like trending up in terms of performance over time, that's rarely is it because they need more energy. <laughs> you know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's a rare, rarely a caloric issue and more like a programming and fatigue management side of things, which obviously, you know, calories play a role in, in both of those. But, um, usually the manipulations I make at that point are on, on the training front. Um, but you know, in terms of, you know, photos, I think, yeah, every, every month or two in the off season, I think it is good. Um, you know, I, I just had an athlete today ask me like how, how routinely should we update photos in the off season? And, like it's sometimes it's really hard to see, like, especially if you're, you know, more advanced athlete, like you're really not going to see the difference until you cut back down to a significant degree. You know, you, you may, your fuller States may feel slightly more full, but comparing two sets of photos, um, it can be harder. It's kind of like the, the paper towel effect on the, on the way down with fat loss. It's like each pound is going to have a larger visual impact mm-hmm. on the way up. It's kind of the opposite. Like each additional pound, it's like, it's it has less of a visual impact once you get past a certain point. And so, um, which I think has its perks too. Um, like once you get to a point where you've put on some body fat and, you know, let's say you still have, five pounds of, you know, runway to work with. And, you know, each of those pounds, it's like, you're, it doesn't have a huge visual difference. Like I know for me, like going from like two fifteen to two twenty, like, I feel like I look the exact same, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that those, I, what you said, I think is kind of the big thing. Like if, if it's an issue of, like degree of surplus, you know, if they're, if they're kind of gaining roughly at a, you know, within a weight range that we want, but they're looking, you know, like fat distribution is less favorable. I might pull back a little bit further. Alberto, is there anything else that you might delve into? Like, let's say things are not looking like you want them to, or you're seeing other red flags. Do you start diving into anything else? Like what's training looking like, you know, are you pushing hard enough? Do you ever start delving in more layers underneath there when you see red flags? So the, the visual red flag for my uh, competition athletes is, is going to be a little bit different because like with them, and honestly, it's strictly business because we have the contest weight and we're basing our decisions around that. So it's easy to stay objective. It's like, oh, okay, you know, I, I, I don't like my love handles. It's like, oh, it's like, whatever, dude, we're, we'll be fine. And usually with them, it's, it's quite easy to, to relay that message. It's usually sent over a little bit more sensitive than, than whatever, dude. But with the casuals, like at the end, it's like a lot of this is just having them look good. This is what they signed up for initially. So with them, I'll definitely, um, you know, like if I think there's a little bit more to, to get out of this gaining phase, but you know, they're, they're not comfortable going beyond where we're at right now. Like that's, that's okay. We'll get it next time, you know, and they might need to lose that fat to, to see that. Oh, okay. Wow. Like this is, like my VMs look totally different. Okay, yes, like it was because of what we did on the gaining side. So, uh, so with him, there's a little bit more leeway, right? Because uh, you know the other ones, they're, they're they, you know, they just want to do better on that stage. So it's 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 much simpler in some ways. Um, the biggest red flag I see is just like the loss of focus, just like with a fat loss phase. You know, it's like with him, it's like they are. Maybe they're adhering a little bit less. Like you know, they're not handling social situations that were coming up as well as they did initially when it was exciting and you same thing with the gaining phase like sometimes yeah it's like adherence and that can look many different ways when it comes to to, to gaining they're not eating enough um they're eating too much right like uh, that, that can happen because it's a gaining phase or whatever like that that happens quite frequently we're about to cut anyways um 
So, so yeah, it, it, it has to do with that. And that is just something that the, the longer you do this, the, uh, your ability to, to focus on the task at hand, just, it gets, it gets better and, and you can do it for longer periods of, of time as a bodybuilder. So, so yeah, that's why for, for my beginners, it's like, you know what, six months, like that's really all we need usually when it comes to gaining, cause that's enough to elicit a, uh, a positive response to your physique. Like we can both most well, most likely be able to say like, okay, that was pretty unanimous. It changed. Um, and, and then, you know, we can add some texture in there and like, Hey, here's a cutting phase. So yeah, people just kind of get bored. Yeah. The loss of focus. That's a good, um, uh, that's a, that's a good point that you brought up. Uh, cause yeah, p- people, you know, when they're in their gaining phases, um, you know, and their stomachs are full a lot of times, you know, mm-hmm. um, they, they just tend to neglect things like, you know what, when is the last time that you ate a vegetable or a fruit, you know? When mm-hmm. was the last yep. time that you actually felt hydrated and your piss was yellow, was was clear instead of yellow, you know? Yeah. Uh, things like that. Those are kind of the things that I'll start delving into. Uh, if I'm not liking, you know, kind of what I'm seeing, it's just like things are not, the parts that I want to look bigger are not really looking all that much bigger, you know, and the parts that we really don't want to look softer are kind of starting to look soft. You know, I'll start kind of delving into things like that. And even sometimes training, believe it or not, will kind of start to get a little bit neglected. You know, people will yeah. kind of start yeah. kind of going through the motions, you know, and they'll be just like, okay, well, you know what, I've I've got three sets of 12 on this movement for the last two weeks. It's fine to get two more weeks at three sets of 12, you know, or something like that, you know, just some sort of a, of a lackadaisical approach to their training, you know? Um, and I, I do kind of sometimes insist. It's like, you know what? I want you to send me the last set of this, 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 and this. I want to see it, you know, <laughs> and better yet, have your friend do it. That doesn't know, um, you know, when you're not paying attention to the camera, you know, I want to see what, what that looks like, you know, when, when you're not having the, the camera on, you know, just, just kind of things like that, that I kind of, uh, um, really like to kind of start peeling those layers back, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of not liking, you know, kind of how things are going. So, um, we talked about just kind of watching the scale, making sure the scale is going up. We kind of watched about some of these other proxies like performance and pictures and, and things like that. But I know there's those numbers folks out there. They're going to be like, well, Dude, what about the proteins? You know, don't we want to watch the proteins and make sure that the the, the proteins are in, in in check and they're not too low, not too high? Uh, when you start talking about the numbers and the macros and the micros and the fibers and the carbs and all that kind of stuff, is that stuff you guys pay attention to much at all? Yeah, um, I, I think with with protein specifically, you know, one thing for for most people like having a high protein intake like it, it takes effort like it, it takes a deliberate effort each day um you know there i i have had some athletes where it's like their default is like higher than we need it to be mm. um which is pretty rare but you know i think with with that like you take like a hard gainer or you know we use that term like someone who's very lean and less prone to putting on weight and if it's largely due to maybe managing their appetite a little bit and kind of attenuating just that feeling of fullness to some extent, you know, bringing their protein intake down a bit, I think can actually help if it's, if it's, you know, beyond like a gram per pound. Um, but I think most people, you know, in a surplus kind of that 0.7 to one gram per pound is, is where, most of my athletes are, are hanging out in the off season. And if it's, you know, like for, for somebody who's, you know, more prone, you know, to, to gaining weight rapidly, sometimes I'll, I'll go above that because the satiety aspect actually helps kind of govern that, mm. um, that regulation. So they're, they're not gaining, you know, haphazardly. So, um, but when it comes to like fats and carbs, like I, I'm a big, I mean, as I, as I know, you both are as well. Like, I think we're proponents of like implementing the amount of structure that's necessary for the goal at hand and not like creating additional, you know, parameters that aren't really making a difference. And so, you know, for, for the off season, getting people, you know, if you can get somebody to the point of, you know, just sort of subconsciously tracking protein intake and, you know, gaining it a appropriate rate, like that's awesome. Um, for most people, I think it is, 
you know, that, that's kind of in between, you know, I'll, I'll give them like a rough caloric range, you know, maybe it's a two, 300 calorie range, you know, a protein minimum, and then like a, a fat minimum. And, uh, and where, where I might get a little bit more specific than that, like there's people where we kind of have to transition to that point. Cause they're coming off of, you know, maybe I get a new athlete who's been tracking forever, you know, and that's like a very uncomfortable transition for them. Um, at that point, yeah, we can kind of do it more in layers, but, um, you know, the, the ratio between carbs and fats, it, it seems to make less of a difference when you're in a surplus, like in terms of subjectively how you feel and, you know, even how you perform, like you're still going to have a good bit of substrate available there. And like, unless you're on a, like a really low carb diet, like you're, you're not going to be walking around like glycogen depleted when you're in a surplus. So, um, so I think there's more, more leeway there. And so I, I, I try to keep some autonomy there for the athlete to kind of manage on their end. Yeah, when you talk about protein, sometimes the folks that I want to gain weight and they reluctantly agree that they need to gain weight, that they need to be in a surplus, um, they're they're afraid to, to lose their shreds. I'll do that very same thing as I'll just say, okay, you know what? It ain't going to help you build any, any muscle any faster, but I just want your protein higher. I want to make it 1.5 grams per pound of body weight, you know, 2.8 grams per kilo, you know, whatever. Make it a little bit higher for two reasons. Number one, like you said, Brian, it just seems to be more satiating, you know, and people tend to to govern, you know, how much that that they're gaining. And I'll, that's the only thing I'll have them track. I'm like, otherwise, just eat until you got a full tummy, you know, your three meals a day or four meals a day, you know. And they, usually their calories are not as high as they think that they are when their protein is that high, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and plus, you know, those 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 studies that um, you know, I think it was uh, Eric, you know, did it with Antonio, kind of showed that you kind of tend to look better, you know, when you're gaining weight and your protein's a little bit higher. So I'll kind of give that the, that's, that's, they'll, they'll concede when it's like, oh, okay, well, if I'm going to look better while I'm gaining weight and coach Brad says to do that, make my protein higher, you know, then I'll go ahead and do it. I'll kind of talk and talk them into it kind of in a bartering way, you know, um, Berto, how about you? You know, any, any numbers, things that you, uh, like to kind of sometimes keep an eye on or give the, give to those people that are numbers focused? No, I think on the numbers, it's going to be very similar to what you guys have already mentioned. Um, I'd say more than anything, um, just those fruits and vegetables, like try to just keep them in. You keep them in long enough, like you actually start to enjoy certain fruits and vegetables. And I think this is just important for health and it's going to come in handy when, you know, to have a palate that enjoys these when you are going through a fat loss phase at some point. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that default diet of sorts, it's like, you know, it's like, Hey, that, that skeletal structure, like let's try to keep some semblance of that at some point. Um, cause it's going to make everything just a whole lot easier and, and better when we're, we're transitioning. So yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's pretty much it. Um, protein feedings, like as a, as a just in case it's like, Hey, you know, it's like, let's try to get at least three, um, I'd say with my advanced guys, I'd even urge like, Hey, let's, let's get four. Is it just in case? Cause like time is just so much more important in between sessions, like for, for those guys. Um, so, but, but yeah, relatively, relatively simple. Um, biggest thing is just, I guess just doing the little things like with a certain level of commitment behind them, which again, with fat loss people, at least give you the first few weeks like with uh they give you the first few weeks with like this this high level of like focus and like belief in what it is that we're going to do but with gaining it's it's hard especially when you haven't had a successful one under your belt which which to be honest i think most of the athletes i get that that kind of fall in this category of of um yeah, just like your serious casuals, they, they haven't had a, like, as much as, like, we talk about, like, fat loss, they haven't had a successful fat loss phase, nor a gaining phase that they can look back and be like, damn, like, that one, that one was like magic, and I haven't been able to execute that since, they just haven't had one to begin with, so, um, so, yeah, a lot of our job is, like, just to keep whatever the task is at hand, like, exciting, like, exciting to them, I feel, and gaining, because it's such a slow mover, 
geez, it's hard. Like when I think mm-hmm. about like what I'm supposed to do all of this year, it's like, okay, so I'm supposed to gain somewhere between like 10 and 16 pounds this year, like from here until December. Like that, that's, I'm like, God, that is, that's, that's boring, you know? And even though I, like, I know all the reasons why it is that I am signing up for it. Um, so, so yeah, it's just such a slow process that whatever you got to do to keep it fun. So whether that means it's like, Hey, we can do things on the training side. Uh, like Brian plays hockey in the off season. Like uh, that's, that's another way, you know, just, just, yeah, keep it fun for them. I think is probably cause it's, it's a long drawn out phase, like outside of like your first few months into training. Yeah. So, um, one of the things I want to, I want to kind of take this is, um, odd stuff that you guys, you know, have, have, have ever seen. Like, for example, um, when I went through that, that bout of, uh, of, uh, uh, kind of a cardiac scare where I had that, uh, coronary artery disease in my heart, I went through that full year, which, I mean, it doesn't seem like much, right? It's a year, it was 13 months, whatever, but I basically went like no meat for like a good solid 13 months, right? Because I was afraid that that was what was making my coronary artery disease happen, you know, not knowing much more and investigating things that I I, I didn't uh, um, know at the time. But you know, it was it was this odd um, time frame for me where like protein was extraordinarily low. You know, you can only eat so many beans before you're just so full that you know you don't even feel like eating a protein shake, much less having something from regular food, you know? So it was this really kind of low protein, kind of in the neighborhood of like 90 to 140 grams was kind of the range, you know? Um, I don't think the calories were that high, but I wasn't tracking. The only thing I was tracking was my saturated fat because I wanted to make sure that, you know, saturated fat contributes to LDL like almost directly. So I was really keeping my my saturated fat low. So I was eating, you know, just lots of vegetables and beans and, you know, no dairy. That was the other thing. I wasn't taking in any dairy. So it was hard to keep my protein up because of that. And body composition after that solid year just kind of went down the tube, you know, while really not really too much going on with weight. You know, it was just kind of this odd time, you know, and as soon as, I mean, not that I eat a whole lot of meat now, but you know, I, I moderate it, you know, it's a couple times a, a week. Usually I, I, I get a lot more dairy, got my protein up quite a bit. Uh, two years ago, Jeff told me, Brad, I want you to start getting four protein feedings every day. I don't care if it's 10 grams or hundred grams. I want four protein feedings a day. And I've stuck with it ever since then, but the body composition is looking a whole lot better, you know, uh, even being like seven pounds less, you know, to me, that's an odd thing. Like if I had a client, that came to me and that was kind of what the, the, the was going on for that year or so, you know, I would have been like, Hmm, this, this is going to make me rethink a few things. And it, uh, you know, it did, it made me rethink a few things, anything like odd that you guys have had happen before, or, you know, want to elaborate on. <laughs> Go ahead, Berto. I'm still thinking, you know, I'd probably say, um, Yeah, probably it is. It probably has to do with with um, female athletes who have spent a significant amount of their time, like, almost exclusively pursuing that like one and done successful fat loss phase, where we've switched things around and I've got them to commit to to hey like let's let's just like really lift weights and at least eat enough. Um, and yeah, those have been fun because you have these, these girls that like, they've never felt strong, like ever, you know, and they start doing things in the weight room. They're like, damn, it's like, I just, I just, I just press the 50 pound dumbbells or something like that, you know? And, uh, and then obviously you see that, you know, change the shape of, uh, of their physique. And they're like, wow, like I, everything that I was looking for through fat loss, like, I got that and more through basically gaining. So, and and some of those girls, they have been doing it like long enough to the point where they've been kind of getting in their own way where it's like, man, you've been lifting for like five, six years in the back of my mind. I'm like, man, like I, I just, I don't know how much I can help you. Maybe this is 
what we're, we're, we might be pretty close to out of muscle and they do it, they commit to it. And then like two years later, it just looks like a totally different like human being. Um, and they enjoy their gaining phases and they surely have two physiques that they like absolutely love, like just as much. They got their, when we lean down to a fat loss phase, they're like, it's a cool look, but this other look here, I appreciate it just as much for a bunch of different reasons. And um, not just performance either. Sometimes they're like, man, I kind of, I kind of like myself with a little bit more meat on the bones. Like I, I, I've kind of learned to appreciate that. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, just like feeling strong. I think that's, that's something that most people, most people, not just women, I think most people like have never really like felt strong, strong in their life. And like the first time they feel that it's like feeling competent in like anything else, but like strength is one that like we, whether you know it or not, like you just hold so like close to you. Like it's, it's, it's a very useful trait, right? So yeah, that's been, I guess the, the biggest one is just, just getting, especially women to the point where they're like, oh, okay, like, man, like we can change our physique, not just via fat loss, but like via mm-hmm. eating enough and pushing our, and that allows you to push yourself to do things with your body that you didn't even know were possible. Yeah. Yeah. That light bulb moment that I was talking about earlier, that happens a lot with, with females when they realize, oh, you mean I can train and, and, you know, while I'm eating like I probably shouldn't be. And I'm like, you're eating like you should be. So yes, please do train. You <laughs> yeah. know, that you light bulb moment is a big one. Yeah, that's a good one. I think one that, that just came to mind, and I, I guess it's not really a shock. It just seems um, not really surprising. It just seems on the surface, maybe a little counterintuitive is for athletes that have been kind of historically gained just without structure like too too quickly Mm. um and for some of them like you 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 know in the past like i've even given those people you know pretty flexible parameters like with in terms of caloric ranges and they're still gaining you know pretty quickly um kind of what you said brad like kind of auditing like the behaviors like how long has it been since you know you've been high you know truly hydrated you know had fruits and vegetables and so rather than kind of framing it to them as you know pulling back you know or or mitigating you know a specific behavior it's it's more like okay here's here's what i want you to actually aim for each day like this like Mm -hmm. four servings of protein you know few servings of fruits and vegetables each and a lot of the time like even though they're not tracking like everything starts to kind of stabilize there because just having these anchors you know these objectives Mm. throughout the day just kind of regulates everything and it falls into place and so um and, and I think that's that, I mean, the same can be said for fat loss phases. You know, I think the, a lot of coaches, um, and I've caught myself doing this in the past too, you're kind of looking at the data on the spreadsheet and you're kind of managing the data more so than the individual to some mm-hmm. extent at times. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where looking at those like behavioral aspects and, um, you know, just focusing on just a few things at once rather than, okay, these are, I want you to be tracking every day. Like you need to do a better job tracking. It's not, oftentimes it's not that it's just like, let's, let's build some structure that allows these things to happen more organically. And I think that's, that's been something that I I feel like I've gotten a lot better at, you know, over the last handful of years. And, um, yeah, something I use with a lot of athletes now, like their tracker might just be check boxes for specific behaviors, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause how many times have we have just that one thing that someone's neglecting, you know, we just start probing and asking questions and it's like, okay, I don't want you really changing anything except mm. I want you to have two fruits a day, you know, just keep everything the same, but eat two fruits a day. And then you're right. Sometimes things just kind of start happening like we want them to. Yeah. And I think those swings in momentum, like they, they kind of work both ways. You touched on earlier, Brad, like the, the people where sometimes their nutrition is less structured in the off season, like on paper, it makes sense that 
training should be the the constant there like that the you would still benefit from training, you know, hard during those times. But a lot of people, you know, how they're doing one thing is how they kind of do everything. And Mm -hmm. so giving them, um, you know, once they tighten up their structure on the the nutrition side, oftentimes like they're entering the gym with more intent, you know, behind each set They're, you know, they're just paying more attention across the board. And, um, and I think it, yeah, it works both ways. And then once you start implementing some habits like that snowballs and like those, Mm -hmm. those two fruits a day, Mm -hmm. you know, can eventually lead to just some fantastic training sessions because things Mm -hmm. are starting to fall into place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Eight ounces of water with every single meal, you know, and eight ounces of water in between meals, you know, just kind of things like that. So, Mm -hmm. all right, gents. Uh, well, I'm looking at my, my, my notes here and I've got everything, uh, that I wanted to talk about checked off. Did uh, you guys have anything that you wanted to add? I think we covered pretty much everything I could think of as well. Berto, any wise words? I'm I'm good. I gotta I gotta get back to Balkan. <laughs> that's what got, this podcast he's got, triggered. He's got yeah. All right. Thanks guys. Appreciate you joining me today and um until next time. Thank you.